So when we founded CNAS back in 2007, we wanted to create an incubator not only of bold, innovative ideas, but also an incubator of talent, an incubator that would grow the next generation of national security leaders. So as we were crafting our original mission statement, we added a very important sentence at the end. It says, as part of our mission, uh, it's to inform and prepare the national security leaders of today and tomorrow. So there are many ways in which CNAS takes on this aspect of its mission in practice, from investing in the professional development and opportunities of our research assistants and, um, and interns, to establishing the Gates and Panetta fellowships uh, for up-and-coming thought leaders in national security, the Basevich Fellowship, which you're going to hear a little bit more about in just a few minutes, and launching many, many of our staff into public service. One of the most important programs that we have de dedicated to this purpose is the Next Gen National Security Leaders Program. Every year, CNAS selects 20 up-and-coming national security leaders from an applicant pool that's usually way more than 200. And they participate in a year-long program where they meet monthly, engage with current and former national security leaders of all stripes, they write, they publish with CNAS, many of them, and we embark on domestic and overseas learning tours. To date, we've had six classes of national security uh, next-gen leaders with over 110 alumni. And I must say, the evidence is that we've chosen well. These young leaders have gone on to become CEOs, editors-in-chief, senior advisors, professors, deputy assistant secretaries, and so on. And one alum is even featured on one of our panels today, Sam Chirap. I count this program as one of the most important contributions that we've made to the field and to a more promising future. This program would not be possible without the support of some of our partners. Um, this year, it's Lockheed Martin, and actually Robert Rangel has been deeply engaged in this program, co-hosting the events with me, co-leading it, and has been absolutely invaluable. Unfortunately, Robert can't be here today, so I want to turn over the uh, podium to Dan Feta from Lockheed Martin to say a few words. Well, thank you, Michelle. Uh, it's an honor to be here today uh, representing uh, Lockheed Martin on behalf of my boss, Robert Rangel, but I also know I have some colleagues here, including Leo McKay out in the audience. Uh, I've been a fan of CNAS for many years uh, in my many incarnations in D.C. I've had the opportunity to participate in many uh, events and forums, and uh, CNAS really does world-class work. So hats off to you, Michelle, to Kurt, and to Richard for all that you've done and for all those that uh, have joined you along the way. Uh, let me start by saying that Lockheed is a proud uh, partner and sponsor of CNA, uh, CNAS activities. Uh, we have been for years, and in many ways there's a commonality between what uh, CNAS does and what Lockheed does. Both want to uh, have a strong national security, both deliver innovative solutions, and both try to solve complex problems. Uh, CNAS has done a great job over the years, really almost in an immeasurable way of contributing to the national security debate, to foreign policy debates, and so all of you should be proud of what it is that you have done and will likely do, and so we are proud to stand with you as a partner. It's actually because of this great work that, uh, that CNSA, CNAS has done over the past couple years that Lockheed decided to partner uh, with the Next Gen Fellows Program. We agree with the concept wholeheartedly that it's critically important for the future officials of this nation to continually be cultivated and developed. They are the future. They are what, we, uh, what we're going to need. And as we just saw with this previous panel, the world is becoming far more complex. CNAS has done a great job to identify who those folks are and really engage them to be, have them become thought leaders. These uh, fellows that CNAS has, has identified will form a unique and valuable network that, and they will emerge as the core cadre of the future executive and legislative branch, our, uh, leaders in our uh, armed services, the private sector, and international organizations, as someone mentioned before. In reviewing the Next Gen Program's alumni role, I was pleased to see many friends and colleagues uh, that are part of the current class, but are also part of previous classes. CNAS has done a great job, as Michelle just said, with regard to talent selection. Uh, you know, you can certainly select the talent, it's but what that talent then does with it that makes the difference. 
And for me, as I look at this program and in talking with Robert, there's really three key things that will make this program and that will really deliver value to this nation uh, if the fellows do these. And that is one, they continue to get smart and get deep on the issues, the complexity of these issues. So really become those subject matter experts that can understand different perspectives and how it relates to the issue they're trying to solve. Second, these fellows will do well if they can work together and solve problems together. They listen, they bond, and these bonds that endure, so they will cooperate in years to come. And then lastly, they help shape what I think is desperately needed and which CNAS does a great job in, in, in trying to develop, is that narrative uh, that, that needs to be spread here in the country, starting from school classrooms all the way up to Congress, about what is America's role in the world? What is worth defending, fighting, and dying for? And therefore, what should an American foreign policy and national security policy be, and not just a Republican or Democrat, conservative or liberal? That's what will make this fellowship uh, program important. That's what will be the big return for this country. And that's why I think CNAS is in a great position to do that. So hats off to all the fellows, past and present, that are part of it. We at Lockheed, me myself personally, look forward to see what it is you will do now, and more importantly, what you'll be doing in the future. And you couldn't be with a greater organization. Thank you. So I'm hoping that um, we have several of our current and former national security, next gen national security leaders in the audience. So if you are here, please stand so we can give you uh, a round of applause. A few, yes, good. They're hiding in the back. <laughs> but take, take a good look at these folks because these are the folks that we'll all be working for someday. So. <laughs> Um, now I'd like to turn it over to the chairman of the board of the CNAS and my co-founder, uh, Kurt Campbell. Thanks. Thank you very much, Michelle, and particular thanks to Lockheed Martin for the support for this great program. Uh, as Michelle mentioned, nine years ago, I was very proud to work with Michelle to found this organization, and I've watched um, in amazement over the last couple of years the remarkable things that it's been able to achieve. One of the things that we set out to do at the outset was not only to focus on national security in its narrowest terms about what are challenges, what are opportunities, but also to remember the enormous costs, uh, long-term challenges associated with conflict. And in that capacity, we're not only committed to training a new generation, but to remembering um, what was lost in the process. We're very proud that our center has probably the most dynamic effort associated with veterans, uh, the opportunities and the challenges that presents. But we also have tried where we can to remember that this is an enormously uh, difficult set of challenges when we confront conflict in the world. And so one of the first things that we did at the outset was to set up a fellowship, the Besayevich Fellowship, which you're gonna hear a little bit about. We chose that um, name for a number of reasons. Many of us uh, had the opportunity to work uh, under uh, Andy's father uh, when we were uh, graduate students or undergrads. Most professors just close the door, don't really have that much interest in inspiring or uh, talking to or helping young people that are looking for opportunities. Uh, Professor Basevich was the exception for me. Uh, he wouldn't even remember it, but he took time when I was a young person, completely lost, didn't know what I wanted to do with my career. And uh, when the tragedy happened, we decided that we wanted to take the opportunity to set up something that would help remember his son and others who had fallen like him. I will tell you, I've been uh, involved in a lot of scholarships, a lot of fellowships, a lot of choices about when people are given awards and honors. I have never been a part of anything in which if you were chosen to be the Basevich Fellow, it was an unbelievable honor. I've had people break down in my office when informed of that. We're so proud that we were able to establish this and we're even prouder of what the young people who have received this honor have gone on and done with it. So I'm gonna introduce this video so you know a little bit about what um, they've accomplished and then I'm gonna ask the fellows uh, to come up so that you can meet them in person, okay? Well, my wife and I uh, have three daughters. Uh, we had one son. Uh, he was the third of the, of the four children and he was a, a good boy, and we loved him dearly.
as my son matured, and as he began to work, uh, and indeed to include his time uh, in the army, I, I got a sense that he was developing a very powerful shrewdness, an ability to see through pretense. I, I had a sense that applying that shrewdness, that deeper understanding of events, was something that he found very satisfying being able to see beneath the surface of events can enable you, could have enabled him to make a real contribution, to, to, to make a difference. I think he was drawn to service. I, I sensed when he was working uh, in state government that he found that very exciting. And my guess is that to the extent that he had a plan for his future life, his plan was going to involve service of some kind. And in June 2007, um, uh, we heard the news that um, Lieutenant Basevich had passed in Iraq, uh, and, and Kirk Campbell in particular was very close with uh, Dr. Basevich's father, and he thought it would be a fitting tribute um, for this new national security think tank that was sort of, you know, that wanted to position itself as a place to groom the next generation of national security professionals, that a fellowship uh, named in Lieutenant Basevich's honor would be a fitting way to both honor his memory, but also to make sure that over the, over this, the life of this, of this new think tank, now nine years old, that we continue to stay true to that founding mission. This was a young man who was just beloved by everyone who served with him. Um, and who had aspired to have a future career in public service in Washington. And we just felt that we wanted to honor him and we wanted to um, do that by lifting up other young people who had that same commitment to courage and integrity and public service that Lieutenant Basevich did. So when I was awarded the Basevich Fellow, uh, the family had provided us this picture that we used for the first time it was awarded in June of 2007. Uh, and I felt that it was important for me as the first Basevich Fellow to have that picture. And so that picture uh, I printed out, I had it printed and had it framed for myself um, to, put on, to put on my desk. And that picture followed me and it will follow me for the rest of my career. And for me it's a constant reminder of, of, of what national security decisions mean and the importance of getting it right and the importance of not being flip and cavalier about uh, weighing use of force decisions that can ultimately result in people losing their lives. Um, so I, I always had this idea that I wanted to come to CNAS and, and the Basevich Fellowship is part of that consideration. You know, junior researchers can, can move through the ranks and, and be able to engage in the policy conversation at a higher level during their time here. I get to work in a really collaborative environment where I'm constantly learning. This is like a, a whole new level of education. And also working in an environment where individuals, um, where young individuals, the, the next generation of national security leaders are really um, fostered and developed and mentored. Most think tanks try to fill their ranks with um, policymakers who, who have done their time and have left um, government. And what we're trying to do is uh, bring up the next generation to go into government and to go into public service. And the Basevich Fellowship is a key part of that, bringing in the next generation of national security leaders and training them, giving them both the expertise but also understanding the networks and how Washington works to be able to be effective in bringing those new ideas and putting them into practice in the real world. The Basevich Fellowship is one of the most important things that's ever happened to me aside from being married and having a child. And I don't say that lightly, I say it more in terms of the values that it's instilled, in terms of what focuses my time and efforts and what really drives me. Not a week goes by where I don't look back at the times and experiences I had at CNAS and the experiences that were afforded to me by the Basevich Fellowship. And without those, I, I know for a fact I wouldn't be where I am today. And, and I'm very proud of those accomplishments, but I'm also just gratefully honored and humbled by um, uh, the opportunity to have served as a Basevich Fellow during a very formative period in my professional life. Basevich Fellows have started to um, have started to 
uh, be present in all the different elements of statecraft. And I think what that means to me is that, you know, as an as a, as a aggregate uh, uh, class of Basevich Fellows, we are, you know, in our own little way, you know, living um, and having the career, the careers that maybe Lieutenant Basevich would have had. Um, and so I'd like to think that, that that's a good fitting tribute to him. You can imagine the very first time the award was given in June of 2007, we had the Basevich family with us and uh, it was a very emotional uh, event. Um, I think everybody on the stage was, was in tears um, over the course of the, the, um, the, uh, the ceremony, if you will. It's just been a wonderful um, honor for us to be able to use the Basevich name to lift up these talented young people um, and help them launch their careers in public service. The initiative for creating the fellowship uh, in my son's name uh, was entirely uh, the work of CNAS. Uh, it wasn't something I suggested, it wasn't something I would have dared to suggest. Uh, but I can tell you that my family uh, was deeply touched uh, at this remembrance of our son, my son, and that we remain grateful uh, for, for what CNAS has done. Well, th thank you uh, for your attention to that. It, as you can tell by that video, that's a, it's a pretty uh, fundamental part of what we do at CNAS and a pretty fundamental part of each annual conference. So thank you for your attention. And also thank you to, to those who made that video possible. You know, this is the, the, uh, the eighth or ninth uh, award ceremony for this. First time we've done that video. So thank you for those who participated in that. You know, as both Kurt and Michelle described, you know, we're proud of the role CNAS plays in promoting the careers of tomorrow's national security leaders, as we've said. You know, adjusted for size, we think CNS has placed a greater percentage of our young people, uh, young analysts in the government service than any other think tank around. And so this mission, as you, as you hopefully have gleaned it already, is not an afterthought for us, but it's in fact part of our institutional DNA. Um, and so for the past eight years, this fellowship, the Basevich Fellowship, has been awarded annually to the young CNS analyst in our ranks whose performance, professionalism, and dedication to public service we feel most honors the memory of Lieutenant Basevich. And we're so pleased, sir, uh, to have Dr. Basevich here with us, along with several previous fellows, some of, which, uh, some of whom could not be here, uh, to recognize this year's recipient. So let me take a moment to introduce you to uh, Kate Kidder. Kate came to CNAS as an intern in early 2013 uh, from Kansas State University, where, in addition to doing her PhD, she was the Veterans Student Services Coordinator, where she worked to help veterans through the transition from military life to university life. And she quickly excelled at CNAS and made the transition to a research associate in the summer of 2013, and she hasn't looked back since. Along with Philip Carter, uh, Kate helps lead our CNAS uh, Military Veterans and Society program, which is the first program of its kind uh, in a policy-oriented think tank that looks at the state of our veterans community and the broader all-volunteer force as a core national security issue. I want to welcome Kate's parents, John and Melissa, as well as her husband, Major Joe Kidder of the US Army, they know what we at CNAS have come to know about Kate, that she is committed, she's humble, she's hardworking, and she's prepared to dedicate her career to America's national security. And we're so proud of the work that she has done and will continue to do. So, in enduring recognition of Lieutenant Andrew Basevich's exceptional commitment to the service of our nation, it's my pleasure to introduce Catherine Kidder as the Lieutenant Andrew Basevich Jr. National Security Fellow for 2015. I'm definitely a feeler who works in a think tank, so you'll forgive me after the video and, and, and the honoring tribute to Lieutenant Basevich. Um, it, it's certainly a humbling honor to receive the Basevich Fellowship. As we've seen in the moving video and heard in Sean's remarks, Lieutenant Basevich was an incredible human being with wisdom and perspective far beyond the years he was allowed to walk on this earth. 
In his life, Lieutenant Andrew Basevich exuded the sense of selfless service that we so often associate with our members in uniform. In his death, he continues to serve as a constant reminder of the individual costs associated with our policy decisions, frequently occurring thousands of miles away from the battlefield. In the same way, working at CNAS is a humbling experience. On a daily basis, I'm surrounded by individuals who weigh the burdens of their policy decisions and recommendations with a deep and profound sense of how those decisions affect the lives of those at the other end of the spear. Like many in this audience and like many in the office, I too have walked along and mourned beside young widows and family members who we've lost uh, service members in the last 13 years. Many of us have also walked alongside those walking wounded who, whose experiences in war have changed them. Uh, many are stronger because of it, but all are changed. The thoughtfulness of my colleagues as they weigh the risks of conflict play out profoundly in the form of the CNAS commitment to raise this next generation of national security leaders. There's a concept that we think about and talk about in the hallways as we're walking about, about, um, you know, you've heard a lot about our thoughts on emerging military technologies and there's this concept of the human in the loop and we frequently think about no matter how far removed we can take human beings from the battlefield, there's always going to be a human risk, um, whether it's the, ex you know, the individual who uh, is sitting in Nellis Air Force Base as a drone operator miles away from, from, the, from the battlefield, they still experience the, the change that comes with war. What I've come to understand through the mentoring relationships I've experienced here at CNAS is that this same sentiment holds true in the policymaking world, that humanity is never that far removed from the tough choices. While there are thousands of miles between the Pentagon, the White House, Capitol Hill, and places like Kabul and Baghdad, those charged with making the tough strategic decisions, be it deciding whether and where to engage in conflict, prioritizing risks across the globe, or those more seemingly boilerplate issues, such as where to invest our research and development dollars, or how to best compensate our service members. That distance is never so far that it can't be bridged by the weight of a common humanity. Working at CNAS, I've been exposed to individuals from all part of the government and both sides of the aisle, from the Pentagon, the National Security Council, the White House, and Capitol Hill. The most meaningful expression of the CNAS commitment to building, investing, and mentoring the next generation of national security leaders has been the open way in which our, our leadership, the program directors, have honestly shared their experiences and the weight of that decision-making process when faced with the, ex the option of expending U.S. blood and treasure. While no one is ever truly prepared to make those decisions, I count the investments made in me here and in all of the junior staff here as the best preparation possible for a lifetime of service in the policy sphere in the future. As I take on this new title and the responsibility that comes with it, my sincerest hope is that I honor Lieutenant Basevich and his commitment to service and the nation. Thank you.